You probably have read Eric Dagan's work on TampaBay.com or in the St. Pete Times. He um, has been called the most critical guy at the St. Pete Times, like the most critical to the team or the most <laughs> <laughs> critical no, person no, there? No, no, the most jerky guy who points out everything that's wrong in <laughs> music and television and politics. So. And you may have also heard his commentary on NPR, where he also talks about TV and media. Today, Eric is going to be telling an anecdote about a local news story and how a shock jock helped to speed up the news cycle. So, Eric, you're the first person to get to finish this sentence. The future of journalism is? The future of journalism is conversation and connection. Take it away. We're going to talk about that. So, thanks a lot. I want to thank the TED people for having me here. I want to thank the Pointer people for having me here, SBC and all the other folks who've been mentioned. This is my first TED talk, so forgive me if I stumble a bit, but hopefully we'll all get through it together. I'm going to tell you a story about how a radio shock jock named Bubba the Love Sponge and a sex worker making explicit webcam videos in her home turned the local news establishment upside down. When the worst sort of event happened here in St. Petersburg, we had the shooting death of two police officers by a fugitive who was holed up inside a house. Now, in the process, these two managed to embody nearly every element of change in media that I've been talking about for the last couple of years, showing how social media platforms and the internet increasingly dominate the news process. Now, for me, this story began uh, when I was dropping my daughter off at this school called Jamerson Elementary, which is on the west side of town in St. Petersburg. And I noticed all these police cars were kind of going in the opposite direction, which is not necessarily a great sign. And I was wondering what was going on, so I turned on, and I just turned on my radio because I keep touch of what, uh, in what, on what, what Bubba does because he's a local newsmaker. And I wasn't tuning in expecting to hear about what was going on there, but this is what I heard. Can we click on that? Is there a way to click on that? Yeah. Click on that, uh, if you can click on that icon right down there, the speaker. There you go. Yeah, almost had it. There you go. Click on that. Hmm. Do we have, is this the, um, is this the uh, keynote version or is this PowerPoint? PowerPoint. We need the keynote version up. Okay. Well, basically, what you would have heard was audio of um, uh, this call that Bubba got uh, from a listener who was actually at the scene of this incident as it was happening. Um, he apparently was inside the cordon of police uh, who had sealed off the neighborhood um, when a fugitive was holed up inside of a house. This guy had already shot uh, three police officers and um, there was some question as to what had happened to them at the time. It was just kind of unfolding. These officers had confronted the guy early in the morning and uh, Bubba was taking this call from a listener uh, who was telling him what was happening at the scene. Now, because the police had cordoned off the neighborhood, traditional media couldn't get close to see what was going on. And what you would have heard was the shots from the police trading shots with the uh, fugitive uh, going out over this guy's uh, radio broadcast at a time when conventional TV and conventional radio reporters couldn't get close enough to air that kind of audio. So. Uh, shot, uh, Bubba the Love Sponge, uh, here's the scene right here. You see all the police cars kind of gathered around. And Bubba has this cadre of listeners and supporters that he calls the Bubba Army. And he enlists these guys in order to help him gather information and material for his shows. So when this started to break out, um, he started getting calls from police officers that he knew. At least this is what, he's telling, what he told me afterwards getting calls from police officers that he knew, listening to the scanners, and hearing from uh, people who were close to the scene who could tell him what was going on in real time. And he was passing this on to his listeners. Now, believe it or not, Bubba actually changed his name <laughs> to Bubba the Love Sponge. So I, I'm calling him by his real name. <laughs> and so it was kind of odd to be getting real-time reports on what was happening from a guy named Bubba the Love Sponge. Uh, but he has a Twitter account, he has a social media profile, of course he has this radio show, and he's constantly delivering information 
that even local TV and radio uh, could not provide. Which brings us to the first thing I always tell people about social media when I talk about it. Social media and smartphones are turning everyone into a news outlet. Those of us in the news business have seen our jobs transform from reporting news to verifying it and curating it because you're carrying a news outlet right on your hip. And in this case, Bubba transformed every one of his listeners who was willing and had a news outlet on their hip to giving him information that we weren't quite willing or ready to release at the time or might not even be able to get. Now in this situation, the problem for traditional news outlets was twofold. Number one, it was hard to get our reporters close to the scene to find out what was going on. Number two, we traditionally try to gather all the information and verify it and make sure we know what's going on before we start relating that information to the public. In this case, Bubba had kind of set up a pipeline where those bars were lowered. And he was sending out this information to people, uh, I think at a time when more traditional news outlets might have held back, might have tried to verify with police, might have tried to hang some kind of verification on an official news outlet like the um, police union um, or someone who might know what's going on. But this brings us to another important um, conversational piece here. Journalism has become an act. Now that we have these news outlets on our hip, you can be hanging out, enjoying the day, news happens in front of you, and all of a sudden you pick up that smartphone and you're committing journalism. Now, in Bubba's case, what he was doing, uh, he told the public before any traditional news outlet that two police officers had been killed. That was information that the police was being careful about releasing, uh, but he had someone on the scene and presumably some officers who were there who told him this information. Now, it was kind of odd the way it happened because he, he said two officers had been killed and then he kind of took it back and then he reaffirmed that it had happened. Uh, he also said a police dog had been killed on the scene and we found out that it wasn't true. Um, he also released the identity of the man who was holed up inside of the house, Hydra Lacey Jr., uh, a guy who had had uh, many run-ins with the law before and turned out to be the brother of professional boxer Jeff Lacey. So while this was unfolding, and the cops had this guy in a court and they were trading shots with him and everyone else in traditional media was trying to figure out what was going on. Bubba was on the internet finding out about Hydra Lacey's record, finding out about his ties to Jeff Lacey, talking about his extensive criminal past and letting uh, his listeners know uh, before anyone uh, who was involved in this and what was going on. And he wasn't the only non-traditional news outlet passing along this information. Turns out there's a woman uh, who tweets links to explicit uh, videos, um, apparently from her home. She's known as Nina DeVoe or Mistress Nina. I don't know. I, I won't ask any of you if you're familiar with her work. I'm going to assume that you're not. Um, but apparently she lived uh, very close to where this was going on and went outside her home and saw this going on. So all of a sudden her Twitter feeds start to change from uh, accounts of, you can see this kind of action here, click this link, to, oh my god, I can't believe what's going on uh, right close to my house. And um, she used a hashtag that uh, a lot of people on Twitter were using to um, identify tweets that were related to this incident. So her tweets showed up on the homepage of the St. Petersburg Times, <laughs> where we had decided to uh, put a little utility where you could see all the tweets. So all of a sudden, and, and her, um, her uh, Twitter uh, page has been changed to something that is much more palatable. But at the time, it was uh, a, a very explicit term that I can't even share in polite company. <laughs> if you want to ask me after this talk is over, I'll be happy to share it with you. Uh, just promise not to be offended. But um, at the time, you know, if you're watching this hashtag come up on our website, all of a sudden you see this, mm, this name come up, and you're like, what the? <laughs> Why is, you know, X tweeting this? Well, it, it turns out she had decided to commit the act of journalism. So all of a sudden, um, people could go to her Twitter page and get the kind of information about what was going on there that even we couldn't provide or wouldn't provide. So as I said, social media is changing journalism from a craft to an act. Um, all of a sudden, this is, this is the uh, more palatable name for a web page, 
But you can see one of the tweets that she was passing along. He had one of them hostage guns with blazing close to my home. This dude keeps shooting as we speak. Wow. So you get a sense of how she is transporting you uh, to the scene in a way that even traditional media uh, couldn't do. And of course, these disclosures start to put a little tr uh, pressure on traditional news outlets because all of a sudden, we have these people that we're competing with that we didn't even know we were competing with. And we have to figure out what can we share that's ethical and responsible and accurate uh, to try and match what they're doing. Now, I think if you would ask uh, some of the folks at the St. Pete Times about it, they would say they were a little less concerned about competing with Bubba <laughs> than they were about what the, the TV outlets were disclosing and what our own uh, competition, say the Tampa Tribune, was disclosing on their website. Um, but I think we did see, for example, um, we did see uh, Bay News 9, which is the local cable news channel, release the names of the officers who had been shot uh, before they planned to. They had gotten the names from uh, the police union, and they thought that meant that it was okay for them to release them. It turns out the police wanted to wait until later in the day when they had a press conference. So Bay News 9 pulled the uh, names back, but once we realized that the families of the officers knew that they had been shot and there was no chance of a close family member finding out from us, we went on ahead and published the names before the press conference. Um, one thing, one disclosure that I think may have been affected by all of this, um, the local Fox affiliate, Fox 13, revealed the identity of Hydra Lacey Jr. Um, I want to say sometime around uh, 1 p.m., I want to say. Um, so uh, quite a while after Bubba had already been talking about the identity of the shooter, the first traditional media news outlet uh, put out his name. And I think there was some sense that if there's a major uh, radio personality who's already talking about this guy, already talking about his record, already talking about his impact in the community, does it make sense to hold it back uh, simply because the police uh, you don't want to reveal everything at a 4 p.m. press conference. So this brings up something else. One of the things that we find is that social media also creates an on-demand attitude among people who use it. Um, I'm sure you're experiencing this in your own life. You're not willing to wait anymore uh, for when we are ready, to, we as media providers are ready to present something to you. Um, you want to receive the information when you're ready to receive it or when it's happening. So once you have a sense that a news event is breaking out and that there are some people on the scene who know what's going on and they're transmitting that information, I think it just quite naturally creates this pressure in other news outlets to report what's going on. We don't have patience for media messages that don't seem relevant. We demand material that speaks directly to what we care about. And we want media that reaches us where we are when we want to be reached. Now, I'm sure some of you old heads in the audience, I won't point you out, <laughs> will remember when we had three, four TV stations, we had uh, a very restricted array of news outlets. And so you might sit through the Carol Burnett Show to get to All in the Family. You might sit through a news broadcast in order to get to that baseball game. But all of that is gone. Appointment television, appointment news is what you make of it when it reaches you. And in this event, as the clock got past noon, news consumers had a really wide array of news sources to choose from. They had Twitter feeds. They had two newspapers. They had five local TV stations. They had three news radio outlets. They had Facebook pages and websites for all these traditional media outlets, in addition to the two uh, outlets that I already mentioned. So that is a lot of information that you can reach out and develop to your needs. If you're at work, you don't want to hear about the shooting till it's over, you can go on any website, read everything you want when it's all concluded. If you live nearby or you have kids in the school like I did, believe me, I wanted to hear what was happening the second it was happening. So in a way, even though I was troubled by the ethical implications of having a shock jock be the first person who's reporting on stuff, part of me was kind of glad that somebody was putting that information out there. And I had a sense of what that scene was like, how it was contained, how they were dealing with this guy. Which brings us to another point. I feel like the audience these days is using social media and the new technology to choose their news products. 
What I think people are doing, and you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, and I'm sure some of you will <laughs> after this is over, but I, I get this sense that people are creating a news ecology for themselves. They have an array of news inputs, if you will, uh, that form their media diet, and they've created this rhythm in their lives for how they're going to consult them. You get up in the morning and you turn on the Today Show, or you turn on your computer, and then you get in your car and you turn on your radio, and then when you get to work, when you're supposed to be working, you know you're surfing those news sites, especially if you want to see that uh, amazing World Series game uh, last night. Because it was at 12.30, man, and I wasn't staying up that late. <laughs> uh, so I saw it on the Today Show this morning. But you know, you create this sort of rhythm of news sources that you're going to consult throughout your day. And the challenge for today's journalists is to break into that rhythm, become one of those trusted sites, become a landing point or an entry point for the consumer at some point during their day. And that's why news is becoming a conversation, because people are not happy with just having information broadcast to them anymore. Again, you guys are probably high-end users. You understand this as well as anybody. You want to have some back and forth. If somebody reports something that you think is wrong off base, you want to be able to tell them, and you want to have that impact the next time they report on that subject. And if I'm smart, I'm doing that. I'm tapping you. When I was doing my report on the uh, Super Bowl commercials um, in January or February, um, what helped me was that I was able to put out Twitter tweets, Facebook posts, uh, and blog posts to provide my, my analysis of the commercials before anything hit the print in the newspaper. And people started giving me feedback already. I will tell you, I hate to admit this, but I hated that commercial with the kid in the, uh, in the Darth Vader costume starting up the Volkswagen. I didn't like it. I thought it was stupid. And I had all these people telling me, you are an idiot. <laughs> This is a cute commercial. So OK, um, I, I put it at the top of my list reluctantly. And it turned out to be the most engaging commercial of that whole, uh, that whole game. So I let my audience teach me something. And any smart journalist would do that. That's just part of breaking in to this media ecology and finding out what's going on. Uh, I have my own array of social media platforms. And as this uh, shooting event was going on, I was utilizing them to talk to my audience and gather more information about what was going on and also find out what they were consuming. So I was able to broadcast on Twitter what I was hearing. When I heard that, the, uh, that Bubba had disclosed that two cops had died, I put that on my Twitter feed and said, hmm, this seems kind of interesting. Has anybody reported this? And I heard back from my people, huh? this is the first time we've heard this. You know. So it was just another way to get some information about what was going on and have this two-way conversation. So even as this sort of a unique thing was happening in local media, I was having a conversation with high-end users about what was going on. Um, I often use Twitter to ar arrange these things. This is TweetDeck, a program that I use for that. And so we have to be careful, because different media messengers close themselves in the garb of journalists. And that's what happened, I think, with Bubba. Once he started committing journalism as an act, his broadcast got clothed in the garb of journalism. When, when I give these speeches, I'm always encouraging people to be incisive about these media um, outlets and about what they're doing. Because once journalism becomes an act, anybody can do it. And you can never be sure what standards they're using uh, to decide when they're going to report something to you. So, I want to end with a quote. I'm not sucking up to the president of Point Institute, I swear. But she summed it up. Great journalism 